Hello and welcome to video lecture number 97. Today we are talking about an era of limits. Our subsections are energy crisis, environmentalism, economic transformation, and finally politics in flux, 74 to 1980. So the national economy, uh, which had flourished since the war years of the 1940s, uh, began to reveal problems during the late 1960s. These intensified during the following decade, resulting in stagflation, uh, a combination of inflation and unemployment. Many intera interacting factors contributed to the worsening economic situation. During the Johnson presidency, uh, escalating expenditures on the Vietnam War, uh, combined with spending on domestic programs, uh, from the space race to the Great Society, fueled budget deficits. Uh, despite Johnson's spending on what was called guns and butter, he nevertheless left office in 1969 with a budget surplus, the last surplus until 1999, 30 years later. In 1971, the nation experienced its first trade deficit of the century, and international confidence in the dollar waned. So let's have a closer look at this era of limits, starting with the energy crisis. Once the world's leading producer, the U.S. had become heavily dependent on imported oil, mostly from the Persian Gulf. When Middle Eastern states threw off the remnants of European colonialism, they demanded concessions for access to the fields. In 1960, oil-rich developing countries uh, formed a cartel. Uh, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. Conflict between uh, Israel and the neighboring Arab states of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan politicized OPEC between 1967 and 73. In the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Egypt and Syria invaded Israel to regain territory lost in the 67 conflict. Uh, Israel prevailed, but only after being resupplied by an emergency American airlift. Resentful of American support for Israel, the Arab states in OPEC declared an oil embargo in October 1973. The United States then scrambled to meet its energy needs in the face of the oil shortage. Congress imposed a national speed limit of 55 miles an hour to conserve fuel, and Americans also began to buy smaller, more fuel-efficient foreign cars. Sales of American cars then slumped with one of every six jobs in the country generated directly or indirectly by the auto industry, uh, the effects rippled across the economy. Compounding the distress was the raging inflation set off by the oil shortage. Prices rose by nearly 20% in 1974 alone. All right, let's move on to the next section, environmentalism. The energy crisis drove home the realization that the Earth's resources were not limitless. Uh, the environmental movement was an offshoot of 60s activism, but it had numerous historical precedents. The movement uh, had received a hefty push back in 1962 when biologist Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, a stunning analysis of the impact of the pesticide DDT on the food chain. In 1970, on the heels of the Santa Barbara oil spill, Congress then passed the National Environmental Policy Act, which created the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA. A spate of new laws followed. The Clean Air Act, 1970, the Occupational Health and Safety Act from 1970, the Water Pollution Control Act from 72, and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Corporations resented environmental regulations, as, as did many of their workers, who believed that tightened standards threatened their jobs. By the 1980s, environmentalism starkly divided Americans. Now, by 1974, uh, utility companies were operating 42 nuclear power plants, with 100 more planned. Environmentalists, however, publicized other dangers of using nuclear power. Uh, a meltdown at one of these reactors would be catastrophic, and so, in slow motion, might be radioactive wastes uh, that they produced. These fears seemed to be confirmed in March of 1979, 
when the reactor core at the Three Mile Island nuclear plant near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania came close to a meltdown. This near uh, catastrophe enabled environmentalists to win the battle over nuclear energy. Uh, after Three Mile Island, no new nuclear plants were authorized. Today, nuclear reactors account for 20% of all U.S. power generation, which is substantially less than several European nations, uh, but still fourth in the world. Okay, our next section is economic transformation. In addition to the energy crisis, uh, the economy was beset by a host of longer term problems. Government spending on the Vietnam War and the Great Society made for a growing federal deficit and spiraling inflation. In the industrial sector, the country faced more robust competition from West Germany and Japan. America's share of world trade then dropped from 32% in 1955 to 18% in 1970 and was headed downward. Many of these economic woes highlighted a transformation in the United States from an industrial manufacturing economy to a post-industrial service economy. In the short run, the economy was hit by a devastating combination of unemployment and inflation at the same time. This is called stagflation. For ordinary Americans, the reality of stagflation was a noticeable decline in their standard of living. Now, none of the three presidents of the 1970s, uh, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Jimmy Carter, had much luck tackling stagflation. Nixon's new economic policy imposed temporary price and wage controls in 1971 in an effort to curb inflation. Uh, he removed the U.S. from the gold standard allowing the dollar to float in international currency markets. Uh, the underlying weaknesses, though, in the U.S. economy still remained. Uh, Gerald Ford's program, uh, Whip Inflation Now, uh, the WIN campaign, urged Americans to cut food waste and to do more with less, uh, but it was deeply unpopular. And Carter's policies would be similarly ineffective. America's economic woes struck hardest, though, at the industrial sector, which began to be dismantled. Worst hit was the steel industry, as foreign steel flooded into the United States during the 1970s. The steel industry was the prime example uh, of what became known as deindustrialization. The country was in the throes of an economic transformation that left it largely stripped of its industrial base. Deindustrialization threw many blue-collar workers out of well-paid union jobs. Deindustrialization dealt an especially harsh blow then to the labor movement, which had facilitated the post-war expansion of that middle class. Instead of seeking higher wages then, unions uh, mainly fought just to save jobs. Uh, union membership also went into a steep decline. Now with labor's decline, a main buttress of the New Deal coalition was coming undone. Middle class flight to the suburbs continued uh, and the urban crisis of the 1960s spilled into the era of limits. Facing huge price inflation and mounting piles of debt uh, to finance social services for the poor and to replace disappearing tax revenue, nearly every city Every major American city struggled to pay its bills in the 1970s. Cities faced declining fortunes in these years also for many other reasons, uh, but one key was the continued loss of residents and businesses to nearby suburbs. Suburbanization uh, and the economic crisis combined powerfully in what became known as the tax revolt, uh, a dramatic reversal of the post-war spirit of generous public investment. The premier example of this was California's Proposition 13, uh, an initiative that would roll back property taxes, cap future increases for present owners, and require that all tax measures have a two-thirds majority in the legislature. Proposition 13 hobbled uh, public spending in the nation's most populous state of California. Uh, it, and it also inspired tax revolts across the country and helped conservatives define an enduring issue, uh, low taxes. 
So let's look at politics in flux from 1974 to 1980. A search for order characterized national politics in the 70s as well. Uh, liberals were in retreat, but conservatives had not yet put forth a clear alternative. 75 new Democratic members of the House came to Washington after the 1974 midterm elections, in which they made Watergate and Ford's pardon of Nixon their top issues. Democratic majorities in both houses of Congress eliminated the House Un-American Activities Committee uh, and reduced the number of votes needed to end a filibuster from 67 down to 60. Democrats dismantled also the existing committee structure in Congress, which had entrenched power in the hands of a few elite committee chairs, and they also passed the Ethics in Government Act. Ironically, the post-Watergate reforms made government less efficient and more susceptible to special interests. A diffuse power structure actually gave lobbyists more places to exert their influence. Influence shifted to party leaders then, and with little incentive to compromise, the parties grew more rigid and bipartisanship became rare. Now, despite Democratic gains in, in 1974, liberalism proved unable to stop runaway inflation or speed up economic growth. Conservatives in Congress used this opening to articulate alternatives, especially economic deregulation and tax cuts. Deindustrialization de in the Northeast and Midwest and continued population growth in the Sun Belt shifted power toward the West and the South. Now, James E. Carter won the Democratic presidential election in 1976, Jimmy Carter. Uh, trading on Watergate and his down-home down home image, uh, Carter pledged to restore morality to the White House. Carter defeated Ford with 50% of the popular vote. But Carter's inexperience showed. Disdainful of the Democratic establishment, Carter relied heavily on inexperienced advisors from Georgia, uh, leading to chilly relations with congressional leaders. Carter was an economic conservative, and his efforts proved ineffective at reigniting economic growth. Then, the Iranian Revolution curtailed oil supplies again, and gas prices jumped again. Uh, by then, Carter's approval rating had fallen below 30%. Alright, so that's it for our lecture for today. Uh, video lecture number 97, The Era of Limits. So go ahead and answer your review questions at this time and continue on with your notes and your work.